will be starting in one minute. Welcome to church. It's a beautiful Sunday morning, but I, he I hear that things aren't going to stay that way. So please be safe. And let's begin our Sunday morning worship with uh, God's word. Psalm 16. My God, keep me safe. I go to you for safety. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Without you, I don't have anything that is good. Lord, you alone are everything I need. You make my life secure. I am very pleased with what you have given me. I am very happy with what I've received from you. I will praise the Lord. He gives me good advice. Even at night, my heart teaches me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. He is at my right hand so I will always be secure. Father, we thank you for this day. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to open our hearts and our minds to what you would have us here today. Help us worship you, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Father God, as we come before you this morning, we praise your holy name. We thank you so much for your grace, your love. We thank you for your holiness, for your forgiveness. We thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for his, his death upon the cross that has made it possible for us to have salvation, made it possible for us to enter into fellowship with you. So, Father God, we just come before you and we just praise you and we thank you. And we don't even have the words to express to you how grateful we are. So, Lord, as we have gathered together this day from wherever we are, we're together in the name of Jesus. We have gathered together in his name. And so, Lord, as we open your word together, I pray that, that you would speak to us words of comfort, that you would speak to us words of encouragement, that you would speak to us words of hope, and yes, words of challenge, so that we might go out into the world to be the disciples that you have called us to be. Father God, we give you the praise, we give you the honor, and we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen and amen. Well, good morning. A couple of things before we get started this morning. Uh, first of all, um, just want to remind you that if you are having difficulty with the uh, live feed, uh, we will be putting it onto our YouTube channel. Uh, as soon as possible after the service this morning, so you can always watch it again there, or you can um, come in and, and join us at that point instead of watching it live now. Either way, it doesn't matter. You can go watch it now or watch it this afternoon. It won't matter. And the other thing is I want to remind you that you can still get your tithes and offerings to the church. You can use our GiveLify uh, app, online app. If you need to use it on your computer, GiveLify.com, uh, or you can go onto the uh, app on your smartphone and be able to sign up and find us there. Uh, we have a link to it on our church webpage, so it's easy to find and it's easy to, to, to figure out. Also, uh, you can obviously send money to the church uh, via the mail, snail mail. Uh, we haven't been getting very many checks that way, so I'm assuming that's the way that you're not choosing to use. Uh, but you also can use your bank, and you can sign up for their bill pay, and you can uh, sign up to send a check to the church, and they'll do all the work for you. So there's three different ways that you can give and make sure that the offerings are coming in. By the way, there is a... A finance committee that is scheduled for this evening. We're having a Zoom conference just to talk about the finances of the church, and we'll pass along to you any information that is uh, necessary at that point. Well, this morning we continue in our series on the centered life, about having Jesus Christ as the center of your life. And, and so, to begin with, this morning I want to talk about sports. I know you're not watching any live sports right now. There's none that are being played. But whatever the sport, whatever the athletic competition, anything that you can name from football to football to wrestling to swimming to horseback riding, even golf and curling, the stronger your core, your core, the higher your performance rate is going to be. Every good coach will tell you that you only are as strong as your core. In fact, all of us, if we would exercise five to ten minutes every day doing leg lifts, we would be strengthening our core. And that would be good. Because you see, our core holds our spine and our pelvis in a lined position. So let me ask you, how strong is your core? Now I know, that's a physical question. But let me ask you this. How strong is your spiritual core? I mean, the center of your life spiritually. How strong is it? Is Jesus the center, the core of your life? And how well is it developed? Remember, as we look into Peter, we find that Peter is writing to people that are facing hard times. Uh, we're facing hard times globally right now. But Peter was facing people, uh, writing to people, Christians who were facing hard times because of persecution. Life was tough for them. 
in many ways like it is for us today. So he writes to them and says, remember who you are. Remember who has you in his hands. And remember the high calling that you have. And above all, keep Jesus Christ as the center of your life. You see, the more you center your life on Jesus, the more you're going to experience the blessings of God. And that's very, very important. Now, I'm not going to show you the scripture on slides this morning. So if you have a Bible, you want to look it up yourself. Or if you look, want to look it up on your Bible app, you can. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. There are several verses, and that's why I chose not to put it on the slides this morning. I'm going to read out of the New International Version. 1 Peter 2, 1 Peter 2 verse 1. Therefore, well, let's stop right there. Starts with therefore. Now, you've probably heard me say before, or you've heard other pastors say that anytime you come across the word therefore in Scripture, you've got to look back and find out what it's there for. And so we need to look back and find out why Peter is now saying therefore. And you have to look all the way back into verse 23 of the first chapter. And there you see the words, you have been born again. You have been born again. If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you are a follower of Christ, you have been born again. Therefore, he says now in the beginning of chapter 2, do something about it. Be something. Understand something. And so we read, therefore, verse 1. Rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Now, those are words that we don't use often. And sometimes we say, well, what exactly does that mean? So I'm looking into a different translation now, a new living version, translate, a new life version translation, rather. And it says this for verse 1. Put out of your life hate and lying. Do not pretend to be someone you're not. Do not always want something someone else has. Do not say bad things about other people. There you go. There's verse 1. Fairly well uh, translated for us. Verse 2. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built up into a spiritual house to be a royal priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Verse 6. For, the scripture, for in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And the stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. Verse 9. But you are a chosen people. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's spiritual possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were a people, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Verse 11, dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans, as people who do not know God, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of his visitation. So, 1 Peter 1, 23 said... You have been born again, right? Therefore, therefore what? Therefore, you have a new craving. A new craving. You have a craving to get rid of the things that are holding you back. You have this new desire to get rid of anything that is starving your spirit. Peter says that you have a desire to get rid of 
hate, lying, pretending to be someone you're not, wanting something someone else has, saying bad things about other people. You, you are get to get rid of those because those will starve your life spiritually. And he says you don't want to be doing that because you have been born again. And then he says you will get a you you should have a new craving for the spiritual food you need to grow, the spiritual food. The NIV says you should not want to uh, you should want to drink the pure milk, which is God's word, so that you will grow up and be saved. That's actually the New Life version. Peter uses this picture of a baby here, right? Who of us have not been around a, a, a an infant who is hungry? And they, when they're hungry, they begin to cry. And if they're not fed, they cry louder. Talk about hangry. An infant can really become hangry. And that's the kind of craving that, it were, that, that Peter has in mind when he says, we as children of God, as those who have been born again, should, should crave the word of God just like a baby craves nourishment. See, we need to grow. And the word will help us grow. And it will help our core become stronger. It will help our center in Jesus become stronger. And then also we have a new craving to enjoy the goodness of God. You see, we need uh, to have a desire, this desire for God's goodness. Well, we need to develop this taste for his goodness so that we uh, just have to have it. You just have to have the goodness of God in your life. And so, so you crave it, you desire this, his love, his joy, his peace, his power. We say it around here all the time, God is good. And the answer is all the time. And then I say all the time, and you say, God is good, right? Yeah. Why? Because you have been born again. Second of all, you receive a new center. If you've been born again, because you have been born again, you have a new center. Um, this is one of the greatest passages in the Bible, one of them, because it emphasizes building your life around Christ. Verse 4 says, come to Christ as to a living stone. Men have put him aside, but you have chosen, but he was chosen by God and is of great worth in the sight of God. And so there's several different stones that are talked about here. First of all, I want to say that Jesus is the living stone. That's what it says right here. He is the living stone. Even though he was rejected by humans, God chose him. And he is precious to God. And the first stone that we look at is the living stone. And the emphasis here is on the resurrection from the dead. Jesus is alive. He is no longer dead. He is not like a stone that has no life. He is alive. And we know that stones don't have life, but this one does. And because of the reason, and, and because this one has life, he will not erode. He will not fade away. He is eternal. Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's because he is the living stone. Also, we see here that he is the cornerstone. Twice emphasis is upon Christ as the cornerstone, our foundation, the truster of the one, the tie it all together one. That's what the cornerstone does. You have to understand that, that Peter would have been talking to a group of people when he wrote this that would have understood the, the, the massive size of cornerstones of huge buildings. Peter probably had in mind the temple at this point. And the temple cornerstone was 40 feet long, that's as long as it is from the back entrance of the uh, gymnasium here up to the cross, 40 feet, it's that long, it would have been seven feet, seven feet wide, that's almost the size of two of these panels, two of these panels together in the back are eight feet, so seven feet, and it would have been three and a half feet tall. That's a huge stone. It would have weighed 80 tons. But it was very important. This cornerstone was very important because it is that which the entire foundation and the entire weight of the rest of the building is going to sit on. The structural integrity of the building depends on the strength and the positioning of the cornerstone. 
Jesus is the cornerstone of our faith and our hope and our salvation and our forgiveness. Jesus is that cornerstone. Your life will be rock solid. That means that you can go through anything, face anything, overcome anything because Jesus is your cornerstone. One of my favorite passages of scripture is that it is found in Matthew chapter 7 at the conclusion of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. If you were raised in Sunday school, you remember the song, The Foolish Man Built His House Upon the Sand, and The Wise Man Built His House Upon the Rock. And that entire motif there is about Jesus being the foundation, the cornerstone, the rock on which we build our home, our spiritual home. Jesus is the cornerstone. He is also the capstone. Now, you won't find in this in most translations, but the Greek word that can be translated cornerstone can also be translated capstone. And although Peter probably had in mind the cornerstone, there would have been some of his people that would have heard his, uh, read his letter who would have thought of a capstone. The capstone is the very top stone of the building. The, the very last stone in a pyramid, for example, is the capstone. It is the, the, the pinnacle of all. It is what everyone sees as the highest and the most elevated and the most glorious of the building. That's a pretty important stone as well. Jesus is also this capstone. Let me ask you, is he the capstone of your life? Is he the one that everyone sees when they look at your life? You know, the word of the year in 2013 was from the Oxford Dictionary. The year of the word in 2013 was selfie. And we all take them now, right? I mean, I've been guilty of taking my own. In fact, one of my favorite was ones is the one that I took of, of uh, Patrick and Courtney and myself at their wedding. It's a great selfie. Selfies are good. But selfies also are, are if, if you get down to the, the bottom of it, they are a selfish thing. It's about me. Look where I am. Look what I'm doing. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those. Tom Richmond was taking selfies all through Honduras. And it's great because it shows that he's there and he sees what's going on all around. That's wonderful. But instead of using selfies so much, why don't we take surveys? Instead of taking pictures of ourself in front of things and with people, let's take people of people serving Jesus, surveys, and let's post those. That would be glorifying Jesus. That would be saying that he is the capstone of our life and the lives of those that serve. Just a thought, a capstone. Also, though, Jesus is called a stumbling stone, a rock that makes people fall. You know how when you're taking a walk through a, a, a wilderness trail that has rocks here and there, that every once in a while you're going to step on a rock that moves and you stumble over it? Or maybe one that's raised and you stumble over it? Well, Peter has in mind this situation, and he's saying that those who don't believe in Jesus, who reject him, to them Jesus is a stumbling stone. You see, Jesus does demand a decision. We can either ignore him, well, we really can't. <laughs> That's the point. We can't ignore him. We can't go around him. We can't deny that he's there. So we have two choices. We can either stand on him or we can stumble over him. What is it going to be in your life? Is it going to be a stepping stone or a stumbling stone in your life? You see, unless we get humble, we will stumble on the stone of Jesus Christ. So we not only do we have this new craving, uh, because we've been born again, we have this new sinner, but we also have a new character, a new character. Verses 5 and 9 are the ones that are in focus here. And, and the camera so far has been upon Christ. And now it's as if uh, Peter takes the camera off of Christ and puts it on us. And he says, now look at who you are because you have been born again. You are a living stone. Jesus is the living stone. We are living stones. We are chips off the old block, as it were. 
It's very interesting that every title here that Peter uses is one that deals with community life, a, a community title, meaning that it's not an individualistic thing. But it's about community life. In other words, God is more interested in who we are together than who we are apart. This means that we are meant to live together in community as living stones. To become this living house that grows up connected to the foundation. Individual parts that are built together in order that praise can, can ascend from this spiritual house. That's awesome. Now I understand that all of you are individual stones right now. But soon, and very soon, we're going to have the opportunity to gather back together. And I hope we will fill this place so that we can glorify God together as this community of believers, living stones together. And then in verse 9, that's the living stones. And then in verse 9, we're called a chosen people. You see, it is uh, easy to feel rejected and forgotten when you're going through times of trouble. And that's how these people were feeling that Peter was writing to. But God says to them, don't forget that you are chosen. And after a short time of suffering, that you will reign forever with me because you are chosen. Now, some of you hearing me today have been rejected or are feeling rejected. And maybe today you feel like you're not very chosen, that you feel anonymous, that you feel like nothing is going right in life. But I'm here to tell you that God has a message for you. And it's a simple one. You are chosen. We also find that we are a royal priesthood. A royal priesthood. In the Old Testament, the tribe of Levi were the only ones who could be priests and offer sacrifices to God. But now all followers of Jesus Christ are called priests. And this is good news. You don't have to go to a priest or to a pastor to bring your sacrifice to God like you did in the Old Testament. Now you can go directly to God because you are a priest. You don't have to confess to a pastor or to a priest. You can confess directly to God because you are a priest. You don't have to attend mass or attend church to experience Christ. You can experience him wherever you are because you are a priest. You don't have to be ordained to share the word. You can read it and you can share it with others because you are a priest. You don't have to be ordained to pray for the sick. You can pray for them because you are a priest. You get it? See, the job description of a priest is simply someone who helps bring God and people together. And as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, disciples, followers of Jesus, that now is our privilege, bringing God and people together together so we are a royal priesthood not only that are we we're called a holy nation now i have some bad news for you in this fifth week of shelter in place and the bad news is this america is not a holy nation god loves america i love america god loves whatever nationality and whatever country you're from as you love your country but your country, my country, none of them are a holy nation. Because we are in the process in this world in which we live. We are in the process of redefining marriage. We're in the process of murdering millions of innocent babies. We're in the process of filling the world with evil um, and with all kinds of vices. And we bow down to materialism and we make idols out of celebrities and sports stars. Not much of a holy nation. But what Peter has in mind is the nation of Jesus Christ. In which we are all citizens. So he's saying that oh, not only are, uh, the, the only citizenship that really matters is not whichever country you have a citizenship in. But the one that really matters is that of the kingdom. Citizenship in the kingdom. A holy nation. And that's who you are. Because you have been born again. We're also told that we are a special possession. A special possession. God purchased you as his prized treasure. He says you, Peter says you are God's treasure. The Greek word here means something purchased at a high price 
and consequently of great value to its owner. Now that should make you think of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. So if he was willing to give his son in exchange for us, can you imagine what a treasure we are to him? Because you are born again, you are God's special treasure. So, because you've been born again, you have this new craving, you have this new sinner, you have this new character, but it also gives us a new calling. A new calling, a new mission in life. And I'm going to ask, are you on this mission? The mission is talked about in verse 9. And the first dimension of this mission is, is to announce how good God is is. Are you announcing that? How good God is. See, our culture has this religious view of God that is messed up. Our culture believes God is mad at them, that he is this legalist waiting to judge them. Our culture needs people that have discovered the great love of God, the freedom that is in God, the joy of God, the peace, the understanding that comes from God and are willing to announce it to others. The world needs to hear God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. You should not ever get tired of saying that. Do you believe that? We're called to be the people that announce that. We are also called to abstain. Abstain from those things that will hurt us and to hurt our spirit. Peter is simply saying here, stay alert, church. Because you're at war. You're at war with the sin within. With those desires in you and me that damage our, our destiny. And that if we will indulge in them. Just because you're born again and have a craving for spiritual things. Doesn't mean that you have had your freedom taken away to choose those things that will destroy you. So stay away from them. That's what Peter's saying here. He said you've got to stay in the fight. You have a battle to wage. Abstain from the desires that would pull us down and would hurt our spirit, starve our spirit. Our calling is to be free. Our calling is to live free. Not the cheap kind of freedom that says, if it feels good, do it. That's not freedom. But a healthy kind of freedom that says, if it is good, do it. If it is not good, do it deny it. And then our calling is to attract, to live attractive lives of good character and good deeds. Verse 12. Verse 12 is all about this and it says that, uh, that we are to live such good lives among those that don't know Jesus that they will see our lives even if, if they don't like us and be drawn to God and give glory to Him. That's the life we're called to as, as, as believers. When Peter's talking about the good life, he's not talking about the four-bedroom house with the white picket fence with the 2.3 kids. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the, the deep-down Christian, Christ-following character of Christ's life. Then live good deeds. Then live doing good things. Do as many good things for others that others want uh, you to be around them. Even if they don't believe. Because they see the good that you do. Christians are advertisements for Christ. Right? Some of us are better advertisements for Christ than others. But we all are advertising Christ. Peter says, I want you to be a billboard. I want you to live in a way that the billboard says, God is good. Christ is good. Christ is beautiful. Christ is trustworthy. He is solid. He is the rock. He's the living stone. He is the cornerstone, the capstone. So today I'm inviting you to allow Jesus Christ to be the center of your life. Allow him to be your core. And I'm inviting you who are chosen and God's special possession to strengthen your core. God is good. God is to be praised. Allow him into your life more and more and more. Heavenly Father, as we prepare to close this morning, this, this day, 
Uh, Lord, I just ask that you would indeed speak to our hearts. And in this quietness of the hour, that you would speak to us and that you would, you would just uh, assure us that because we are born again, we're in this great place to experience your blessings. Which means if you're not born again, today's the day. Today's the day to ask Jesus into your life so that you can be reborn. So are you giving your heart to God? Are you giving your heart to Jesus? That's the challenge this day, to give our heart completely to him so that he is our core and so that our core will be strong. Let's sing together, I give you my heart. your holy name and as we prepare to leave this place this day and we leave the place of worship I just pray God that you would help us open our lives up to Jesus and allow him to be the center of our life that we might have a strong core that we might experience all the blessings that you have for us for this day and for the days to come we give you the praise. We give you the honor. We pray this in Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen and amen.